Well, happy Thursday morning. I am Lisa Turkhurst with Joel Mutamale. Both of us work for Proverbs 31 Ministries. Joel is the Director of Theological Research with a lot of degrees behind his name. And I'm representing the average everyday Bible study girl who is um, very passionate about studying the Word of God and excited about what we've been learning. We've been in a three-part series on eschatology, which is the study of end times. And today, I'm really excited about our lesson because we've been walking through a lot. We've looked at the protology versus eschatology, which Joel, help us with the exact definition of protology, the beginning of things or the first of things. Is that right? Yeah. So protology comes from the Greek word protos, which means right. first. Uh, so protos is the study of first things and eschatology, eschatos, which means last, or last things, comes from the study of last things. So you have the two opposites there. And when we look at the Bible, the reason that we are studying both simultaneously is because what we find in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3 is the beginning of an amazing creation story that highlights the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the consistency of God, and his absolute ability to do what he says he's going to do. And so what we find in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, Genesis 1 is what I call the macro view of eternity. It's the big picture of creation that's going to build out into um, an eternal perspective that we're going to find throughout scripture. Mm -hmm. That's Genesis 1 is the overall creation story. Genesis 2 and three, we're going to find a much more micro view. In, in other words, we're going to go and we're going to look through the details of what God created, when he created it, and a lot more detail around the story. And then in Genesis three, we find that though Adam and Eve were living in the perfection of the Garden of Eden, they chose to eat from the one tree that uh, God commanded, you can eat from every other tree in the garden, but this mm -hmm. one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down that good and evil. Mm -hmm. It was such a pinnacle uh, moment, all wrapped up in Adam and Eve and what they did or did not do with this tree. God said, do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But as Paul Harvey would say, we know the rest of the story. And that is that Adam and Eve did choose to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what's really happening here, and I think this is really interesting, is that Adam and Eve had an eternal perspective they were able to commune with God and they were in a state of unawareness of good and evil. They only knew God's goodness. And at the end of Genesis chapter two, where it says Adam and Eve were both naked and they felt no shame, that's because they had no other opinion to contend with but the absolute love of God himself. Mm -hmm. They could stand there physically, emotionally, spiritually, without any fear, without any hesitation, without any desire to want to cover up and hide. Um, I, I love this verse because this is what our heart longs to return to. And really the story of scripture is a longing to return back to what was in Genesis chapter two, to be able to stand completely naked and unashamed with no other competing narrative, but the absolute love and safety, provision, protection of God. It's such a beautiful picture 
of vulnerability with each other and with God. But then in Genesis 3, when Eve takes the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she eats it, then she gives some to her husband, Adam, who was right there with her, and he eats it. When he eats it, that's when the scriptures say, then their eyes were opened, they realize they are naked, and they immediately start to cover themselves, and they hide. Mm -hmm. And I think so much of human behavior that we see, not just throughout scripture, but in our everyday reality is a covering and a hiding and all these competing emotions entered in no longer were they standing there naked and unashamed they realize their nakedness Mm -hmm. they become afraid they become this feeling of guilt they've never felt the weight of emotional nakedness before they've never felt the weight of spiritual nakedness physical nakedness I've often laughed like, I wonder what that moment was really like. Did Eve look at Adam and be like, yo, bro, you got to cover that mess up. Here is you a fig and a leaf. Or, you know, what exactly happened there? I don't know because I wasn't there. But what I do know is it wasn't just physical nakedness. It was emotional nakedness, spiritual nakedness. And all of these competing emotions came in, doubt and, and fear and Um, blaming and shaming and all of these things started happening between one another. But even with man and God, they wanted to hide from God. And um, Adam says he hid because why? He was afraid. Mm. And so that beginning story is very, very important as we look at some of the scriptures that we're going to look at today. Now, just so you know, um, God had already told Adam and Eve, if you eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to see in scripture is they didn't physically die immediately, but the process of physical death starts. But what really happened there is they experience a kind of spiritual death, a separation from God starts to happen. Now, why did God even say don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That knowledge of good and evil, that knowledge of evil is what we experience today. Mm. And Adam and Eve didn't have that weight when they were first created. They didn't have the the weight of uh, a cancer diagnosis. They didn't have the weight of fear in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. They didn't have the weight of wondering about their provision. They didn't have the weight of um, people dying, horrific deaths. They they didn't have the weight of murder and they didn't have the weight of uh, natural disasters happening. They, they, They didn't have the weight of what we see every night when we turn on the evening news. Mm. What we see is that weight of knowing what evil is. And that's why God never wanted Adam and Eve to know that weight. Sometimes when people say, I don't understand why God would allow this to happen or that to happen. And the reason that these hard things happen is because our Adam and Eve, the the first humans, made the choice to want what God said, don't want. Mm -hmm. And they went around God and decided to go ahead and eat that fruit of the knowledge of the good and evil. They traded their eternal perspective for what we have now, a very hyper awareness of what evil is, what evil can do, and what evil causes. So this wasn't God causing this. This is sin and the reality of living in a world that sin was chosen. And um, so I think that that's important. So, so much of my journey with God is this very thing, this tension between the earthly reality of what we see 
and the heavenly reality simultaneously of what God is doing. And both are operating at the same time. There is an eternal perspective and there is an earthly perspective. And in our journey with God and receiving Christ as our personal savior and starting to be able to have our spiritual eyes opened, what that means is it's a return to the eternal perspective, the ability to absolutely acknowledge what we see in our earthly reality, but incorporating into our earthly reality more and more and more of that spiritual perspective, recognizing that there is the hardship of what we see, but simultaneously there is a God that is good, who is working good. Hmm. I often try to remember in the morning to pray this prayer. God is good. God is good to me. And God is good at being God. Mm -hmm. God is good. God is good to me. And God is good at being God. And the more of that spiritual perspective that I can incorporate and almost make it the lens through which I look at my earthly reality, the less I'm afraid, the more peace I will have, the more assurance of God's activity. And the more that I remind myself, we're not in an epic battle where good and evil are equal. Good is supreme mm. and evil is under and always subject to the victory that Jesus Christ already accomplished. And that is he conquered fear and death. So while death right now may be a temporary reality, we see people dying, um, certainly in this worldwide pandemic, our, our level of awareness of that, even just watching the news every night on the news, it seems like there are statistics. Um, some are good, some are awful about people getting sick and dying. And there's there's natural disasters still happening. And so there's, there's all kind of chaos that will always be there in our earthly reality. But the more that we can listen to those things with the absolute assurance of the work, the accomplished work of what Jesus has already done, the more we can have an eternal perspective, almost making our earthly perspective come together so that we don't lose sight of the hope of Jesus. Let me give you a wonderful verse. My glasses broke this week. So, you know, I'm working with an, a half arm here. That's right. So just, you know, if they're a little crooked or out of sorts, just be patient with me. <laughs> All right, let's look at Hebrews chapter two. Now I wanna show you something. Here's my Bible, lots of pages here. At the beginning of the Bible is the table of contents. I love to use this table of contents right here because it helps me find the books of the Bible. I went years thinking Hebrews was in the Old Testament because it just kind of makes sense to me that it would be in the Old Testament. But alas, Hebrews is not in the Old Testament. It's actually in the New Testament and it's this many pages. Do you see right here? Just a few left turn, left hand turns from Revelation. But let me read you this scripture in Hebrews chapter two, starting in verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood. So if you have flesh and blood, raise your hand. Thank you for raising your hand, Joel. I was going to be nervous if you did not raise your hand. Not okay. Any. Since the children have flesh and blood, that's you and that's me. He too shared, who is the he? Jesus. Jesus too shared in their humanity. What in the world? Jesus shared in their humanity. Yes, when he came and he was born of a virgin. He was born in a physical body. He was, he was absolute humanity, but at the same time, he was divinity as well, perfect divinity. So this is such an amazing thing that Jesus, um, that God would provide his one and only son, Jesus, to come and suffer in the ways that our human bodies, our human emotions suffer. Jesus took that on willingly so he could identify with us. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm li listening to a, a pastor or a teacher and they're teaching on 
something like um, healing or they're, they're, they're teaching on even how to have an eternal perspective or how to have hope in the midst of really hard times. If I am not 100% assured that they themselves have suffered mm -hmm. the way that I've suffered, that they've hurt the way that I've hurt, that they've known hardship the way that I've known hardship, maybe even that they've known rejection the way that I've known rejection. If I don't know that they have hurt and suffered and faced things that I've faced, then I start to maybe discredit a little bit of their teaching because my mind instantly says, yeah, but you don't know what I've been through. Yeah, but it's easy for you to say that because your life circumstances in comparison to my life circumstances have been really good. But when I hear a teacher who I know their story of suffering and hardship and a common uh, emotional devastation, when I know that they've walked through some stuff, I trust their teaching on a whole nother level. We know that when Jesus shared in our humanity, he absolutely in his humanity mm -hmm. suffered. He suffered betrayal. He suffered beatings. He suffered rejection. He suffered physically and emotionally. He suffered wrestling, wanting a different plan, even from God. When we look at Jesus and some of the last prayers that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, God, let this cup pass from me. I don't want this to be my reality. But then he followed it up, yet not what I will, but what you will. So when Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 says, Jesus shared in our humanity, that is an absolute statement that we know he understands what it feels like to be so very human, mm. hurting and hoping at the very same time. He too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. Verse 15, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery mm. by their fear of death. I think there's something spreading faster than a virus right now. And I think it's fear. Mm. And this verse right here is such a beautiful place to turn to when talking about the accomplished work of Jesus, resurrection Jesus. You see, because Jesus faced humanity, suffered, died, was buried, and Joel, you and I were talking earlier. We were saying that, you know, if after 2,000 years, they've never found Jesus's body, right? Mm -hmm. And if they were to find Jesus's body, then our faith falls apart. Right. But Jesus is not in the tomb because Jesus conquered death. In other words, from that physical death he experienced, a resurrection happened. This is our hope. Yeah. This is why we don't have to fear death. Now, why is there death even in the first place? We go back all the way to Genesis chapter two and chapter three in Genesis, those, those early beginnings, the, the first parts of the story of the Bible, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was the consequence God told them that they would experience that there would be a death. Now they didn't immediately physically die, but they experienced that separation because sin always separates us. So once they took on that choice of sin, sin created a separation. And then if you look at the end of Genesis three, Adam and Eve are sent out of the garden of Eden. And sometimes when we read that part of Genesis three, um, I know in the NIV, I think the word banished is used and, and that's probably not the truest sense of what happened. 
So it's really God sending them out from the Garden of Eden because there was another tree in the garden. There was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were not supposed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They absolutely could eat from the tree of life and that perpetuated them in an eternal state. But once sin has entered in and their body has now started the process of decay and there's a separation from God, they couldn't stay in the Garden of Eden because to eat from the tree of life would have meant they would be stuck in a separated, sin-soaked, decaying body for eternity. So out of God's mercy, not out of God's anger, but out of God's mercy, he sends them out facing the consequences of their choice because there were consequences for sure. But when he sends them out of the garden, he guards the way to that tree of life so that Adam and Eve in their earthly state now can't get access to being stuck that way in eternity. So he sends them out of the garden and he's going to, God's going to give Adam and Eve and all of humanity a gift that will feel nothing like a gift at all. Mm -hmm. And that gift is that our earthly body will die. But that earthly death is not a finality if we know Jesus. If we know Jesus, that earthly death is but a passageway to experience a new body that has so many amazing qualities. And that's why I think this new body that we will get, if we know Jesus, when our physical body dies, we will get a heavenly body. And the Bible is so clear about the description of how wonderful that resurrected body is. And so when it talks in Hebrews about Jesus freeing us from the fear of death, death does seem scary because there's quite a mystery around it. But I want to read to you what we trade when we go through that passageway of our physical death, we get that spiritual body that's actually satisfying so many of the longings that will never be satisfied here on earth. Mm -hmm. We want perfection here on earth, but we'll never get it here on earth. We must pass through that passageway, if you will, of death to receive the spiritual body. Now, we don't want to experience death before our time. So we don't make this choice. God knows this is one of the mysteries of God. He's ordained every day of our life. And if we were supposed to experience death today, then that would be part of God's plan. But if it's not part of God's plan, that means there is still more for us to do Mm -hmm. here on earth. But let me give you some passages, some scriptures that I think will be very encouraging to you so that there's less mystery around this spiritual body. And remember, we're talking about resurrected Jesus made this possible. So first let's look at what were some of the realities when Jesus was resurrected What could he do in his spiritual body? Because Jesus, after his resurrection, we see him still interacting with earthly realities. He's he's meeting with the disciples in his resurrected body. And so I I, I was teaching a a Bible study recently. Um, I love my Thursday morning Bible study gals I meet in my neighborhood. We're not able to meet right now. So I know some of you are joining by Facebook here. So welcome. So glad you're here. I miss you. Shout out to you, my peeps. But um, we were, you know, we were talking about some of the hesitation, maybe even some of the fear that people have about what is it going to be like in heaven? Like, what is this spiritual body going to be? And some people were very honest and they said, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm always looking forward to that because I picture kind of wearing white drapey cloth, being a spiritual being, floating in the clouds, playing the harp, singing endless worship songs. And I don't know that I'm really looking forward to that. And I loved that they were honest enough to admit Mm -hmm. that there is some hesitation around that. But when we look at Jesus's resurrected 
uh, body. He was eating, he was talking, he was walking, he was even teaching. If you look at John chapter 21, his Jesus and his resurrected body is reinstating Peter. Um, Peter had betrayed Jesus and now Jesus goes and meets with Peter. He's even teaching Peter. He's forgiving Peter. He is having compassion on Peter. So we see this beautiful picture of all of this activity that Jesus is doing in his spiritual body. Our spiritual body is not something to dread. It's actually something to look forward to. And it's part of, last week we talked about this verse, 1 Thessalonians 4. This chapter is very important when you're talking about end times, 1 Thessalonians 4. But looking through verses 13 to, through 18, we see that we don't have to grieve death. We don't have to grieve in, in the things that we experience on earth. We don't have to grieve as those with no hope mm -hmm. because we have so much hope. We have so much to look forward to. That's incorporating that eternal perspective in with our earthly reality. And keeping those two things together is a sign of spiritual maturity and spiritual growth. And that's what I want us to really understand today. In every hard thing that we face, we don't grieve as those with no hope because we know these hard things we face, that's not the end of the story. There's so much more. There's so much that God is doing and working here on earth, but also in eternity. And so I want to give you a couple of verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 44. Now, something interesting about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it is the third longest chapter in the New Testament. It's describing the return of Christ. So Joel's going to unpack that with a little bit more depth. I'm almost done. But here's what I want you to hold on to. This is what we have to look forward to. Our spiritual body, as taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 44, it is imperishable. It is full of glory, reflecting the goodness of God, the glory of God. It is full of power. It is not subject to the limitations of earth and the hardships of earth. And it is spiritual. Now also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 44, we see a description of our natural body. Mm -hmm. Our natural body, which is what we live in now, it is perishable. It is subject to hardships. I think the scripture says dishonor. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of weakness and it is natural. And so I just want you to look at that. It's in our natural body, so much hardship, perishable, dishonor, weakness. But in our spiritual body, we will trade our natural body or, or, or it'll kind of all be like, like last week we were talking about Joel, like caught up in the air. So if we die before Jesus returns, or even if we are still here, when Jesus returns, we will be caught up and there's a transformation of this physical body. And it's a, it's a ridding or shedding of what is perishable, what is dishonorable, what is weak. And then we will, we will get this spiritual body and we will see it's imperishable. It's full of glory. It's full of power. It's so much to look forward to. Yeah. And um, I think some of you may say, okay, so I get this spiritual body. I get it. But when we get to heaven, will we recognize each other? Well, I think that when we see Jesus walking around in his resurrected body, um, some recognized him and some didn't. Some, it took a little bit of time to recognize. If you look at the story, like I just referenced uh, of Peter in John chapter 21, at first Peter doesn't recognize him, but as he comes closer and he, I think, hears the Lord's voice and he starts to see it, what he, what's really happening here is Peter is having to override in his brain. Wait, Christ died. Christ died. 
So that information is informing what I see, but I'm recognizing my Lord. And so you see this tension of Peter wrestling through, could it be, Hmm. could it be Jesus resurrected? And finally, Peter sees Jesus. And so, yes, I, I do think in our spiritual body that those that we know and, and love here on earth will recognize us and, um, and they will see us and we will see them and it will be absolutely glorious. We don't suffer here on earth with no hope. We always have an eternal perspective to look forward to mixed with our earthly reality. It's not that we deny the hardships of earth. We can wrestle through them. We can talk about them. We can process them, but we must always do it through the lens of our spiritual reality. We don't grieve as people with no hope. Hmm. We have so much hope that this isn't all there is. Mm -hmm. I think the greatest suffering that a human can go through is not when they walk through hard things. It's when we walk through hard things and we start to feel like it will never end and that the suffering is pointless. But if you know Jesus today, your suffering will end. For some of you, it will end here on earth. And for some of you, it won't be redeemed until eternity, but there is an end to all suffering. Mm. And it's never pointless. That's really the story of the whole scripture. I told you we begin in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in the, the beauty of the story of the Garden of Eden. And we end in Revelation 21 and 22. And Revelation chapter 22 in my Bible is Eden restored. Mm-hmm. All of that beauty that we see in Genesis 1 and 2, it is restored in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22. So this this whole entire book is a story of God's original destiny being absolutely fulfilled. But what you do in the meantime Well, that's really God's love letter, God's instruction to us of how to hold on to the hope of the amazing plan that God has so we can incorporate a spiritual reality into all of the earthly hardships so that we can have a more complete sense of hope. It's not fake hope. It's not conjured up hope. It is real hope. That is the hope that God gave us in the gift of Jesus Christ. If we know Jesus, then we know with great certainty that the story ends, our story, our life ends in the victory of Jesus, where there will be no more weeping, no more crying, no more death, no more dying, no more hardship. Mm -hmm. And that beautiful perfection that Adam and Eve experienced in Genesis 2 will be ours again. We will be able to stand naked and unashamed with no other competing narrative, but the absolute love of God himself. And what a hope Hmm. that is. Not only do we have the eternal hope, but we have hope here on earth Hmm. because we have a relationship with Jesus here on earth. There is always hope in our situation beyond what we're facing because God is active in earth as in heaven. The eternal perspective is very much alive here on earth. And mostly because you and I are bearers of God's image and we can talk about the hope that we have even in the midst of the hardships that we face because Jesus is alive and God is good. God is good to us and God is good at being God. That's a lot of, whew, that's a lot of, (laughs) Church, up in here, first thing early on a Thursday morning. But Joel, I want to turn it over to you so you can take a deeper dive into First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Yeah, I almost feel like we could just be done right there. That was so good. Like I'm, I'm ready to uh, put on some worship music and just praise Jesus right now. That that gives me such hope. At least I think what you share is so important for us. Um, because what it does is it creates a connection 
between often when we read the Bible, it seems like we have heaven here and we have earth here. So you have spiritual here and you have physical here. And one of the great um, themes and teaching points of the Apostle Paul is to say, actually, God's purpose throughout the story of scripture has always been that heaven and earth would meet together in the presence of God himself. So we've talked about this before. Eden is the first type of temple. And the temple would be the place where the presence of God would dwell. Um, and in the New Testament, I love this thought. Uh, Paul and others say that you and I are the temple of God. Mm. And Acts chapter 2 says that the spirit of God it comes and it indwells inside the people of God. Well, how can the, the presence, the spirit of God dwell inside the people of God? Well, because now we're the temple of God. And when you and I gather together, uh, and I even think about the beauty and the brilliance of a Facebook Live on a Thursday morning at 8.38 uh, Pacific Standard Time, that the universal church is gathered together. And I imagine the beauty of different people from different backgrounds. And I wish I could see every one of y'all's faces. I wish I could see your smiles. I wish I could see the rooms that you're sitting in. I wish I could see the neighborhoods that you're in. Um, and it is a brilliant thought that in this moment that the church is gathered together. How can the church be gathered together? Because the spirit of God knits us together. Mm -hmm. um, and the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, I think he's getting at this reality. He's getting at the reality that back then, the uh, church in Corinth, they're deeply steeped in Greek culture. Um, it's called Greco-Roman culture. And the culture of the time, they, they in some ways like we do, they, there's kind of a separation. And the thought is, this is the big, the big thought. The big thought is that you have life, then you have death. And there is a kind of life after death, but it's very gloomy. It's dark. It's uh, the abyss. It, it, there's nothing to look forward to there. And I love this thought that Paul presents in 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, the thought that Paul presents is actually for the believer, for those that put our faith and trust in Jesus, true life begins after death. Mm. So life for the Christian follows death. It doesn't necessarily precede it in its fullest form. So here's the thought that what we do today, that our lives that we live today have an impact in eternity. And in fact, we have something so much more to look forward to. Um, and Paul in verses 12 through uh, 19, he, he's kind of addressing the hypothetical. And Lisa, you said it. I often think the one thing that the Roman Empire needed to do in order to debunk the faith of Christianity is produce the body. The yeah, body. and say there was no res resurrection. That's it. Right. And Show us the body. Show us the uh, the holes in the wrist. Show us the the piercing in the side. Like like show us the body of the Messiah Jesus. Um, and they couldn't do it. Well, why? Because we believe that Scripture is true and that Jesus rose. He overcame sin and death and rose on the third day. And so Jesus is. So this is the importance here. Jesus is bodily. That means physically. He's got clothes. Like he's you know he's walking around. And simultaneously, he is now also in his new spiritual heavenly body. And so they couldn't produce a body because it was no longer there. And so this is what he says, what Paul says. Um, essentially, uh, if the body was produced, we have no hope. That's what he says in those first few verses. But in verse 20, he says this, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And then if you circle, if you highlight, uh, take notes. I want you to take a note of this phrase, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. I'm going to read that verse again, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now pay attention to the connection between Genesis 1 and 2 and this reality. Verse 21, for as by a man, that man is Adam and Eve, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. 
So you have two comparisons. You have the man who is Adam, and then you have the greater Adam, Jesus. One came death, one uh, makes us alive. Verse 23. Okay, and Joel, and sometimes we'll hear in Bible study or I'll read in commentary, even verses in the Bible will mention first Adam, second Adam. Mm -hmm. And what's being talked about there is first man, that was Adam, as in Adam and Eve in the garden. Second Adam is just another reference point for Jesus that what the first Adam did not do, the second Jesus will do. I mean, the second Adam, Jesus will do. Exactly. So I think that's an important distinction too. Yeah, that's huge. Um, because what it points to is again, what you said earlier, Lisa, that God is, is uh, completing what he started in mm -hmm. Genesis 1 and 2. So I think, by this is just Joel, I think the incarnation when Jesus comes back is actually like a train that has been derailed, right? In Genesis 3, the train has a destination and it's going towards its destination. Well, in Genesis 3, because of sin, sin disrupts and derails the destination that God had placed uh, the train in. And so from uh, Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the incarnation, it is a story of God building bridges, working ahead of the train, and placing it back onto its right track. Because the destination is always for God to be with his people. It's always about presence. Um, and then it says this in verse 23, but each in his own order. This is really interesting. For as in, so verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the, and notice that word again, first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Verse 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Verse 25, for he must reign. So he is reigning. He must reign until, there's a period of time, until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Uh, I wanted us to zero in on that phrase, first fruits. Uh, for me, sometimes what happens is I love reading and I'll just be reading and I'll see a word or a phrase and I'll just skip right over it, right? Because I'm like, oh, that's interesting. But um, one of the things that I have been taught, and Lisa does such a great job of like slowing me down and saying, wait, Joel, that's an interesting word. Like, why, why is that word being used? And it happened to me. Well, I was saying, like, wait a minute, that's an interesting word. And I, I heard Lisa in my brain, like, Joel, why would first fruits be used there? And I did a little bit of study, and I think this is so important. Um, first fruits is steeped in Old Testament language. It's steeped in symbolism and in the reality that in the Old Testament, you would take the first fruits, the first of your crops, and you would bring it to the temple as a sacrifice. The other day, my wife, uh, we're now doing like all this, um, uh, I don't know if y'all are doing this, Lisa, but like all of our shopping is delivery basically now, you know, like it's really interesting. And so uh, I don't know about y'all, but Costco grapes, if you've not had Costco grapes, they are the greatest thing uh, I've ever eaten. And I was eating these grapes and I was wondering, well, if the grapes in this basket are this good, I wish I could have the entire bucket full of grapes where this basket came from. And in agriculture, I was studying a little, little bit on this, you have an indication of what type of crop you're going to get by the first fruits that are produced. So think about this. Jesus is the first fruit amongst those who have fallen asleep. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is the first visible sign, symbol, and promise of a greater harvest that is going to come. Jesus is the first indication of a full harvest that is to be. Now think about okay, this. Joel, hang on. So what does that mean for me? Because yep. I'm sitting here trying to, I want to make sure that I put the right connections together. And yep. if I'm asking that question, maybe there's a couple other people asking that question. So what does that mean to me? Why is this significant? So when you turn to James 1 verse 18, remember the phrase first fruit is used of Jesus. And then it says that Jesus is the first fruit. So that means that there's a greater harvest that's coming. Well, James 1 18 says this. 
um, of his own kind, talking about God the Father, of his own kind, will he brought us forth by the word of truth, now he's talking about us, that we, humanity, those who believe in Jesus, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The same thought is in 2 Thessalonians 2.13 that refers to you and I as being a type of first fruit, first fruit because of our sanctification by the Spirit and our holding uh, firm to the truth of God's Word. So why is this important for us? Because what Paul is saying here is just as Jesus is a type of first fruit from amongst the dead, you and I have the same inheritance. We are the great harvest that is to come afterwards because in the same way that Jesus was raised from the dead, in the same way that he overcame sin and death, you and I in Christ, when we clothe ourselves in Christ, we share in that inheritance that we will have the hope of eternity, that we will overcome death itself just like Jesus did. But I think it's really important that James and Paul himself in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, he refers to us as a type of first fruit. Well, why are we a type of first fruit? Because today, in the present, if we're a type of first fruit, we're a sign, we're a symbol, we're a guarantee, we're a picture of a future promise that could be for a world that is desperate for the hope of eternity. Wow. So I can, I mean, we've been looking at um, the number, I'm just blown away at the people that have joined. And um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity that we get to open God's word. And the burden on my heart the last couple of days as I've been thinking about this, Lisa, I know the same for you, is that inevitably, there are people that are tuning in. Y'all might be tuning in and you have tuned in with a sense of skepticism. You're like, there, there, there's got to be something better on the other side. And I'm not quite sure what it is. And you may be hearing about this and the hope of eternity. Um, and here would be my encouragement to you that the experience of peace, if you're looking around, you're like, these Christians are odd. Because they seem to have a sense of peace in the midst of pandemic. Like, that, that makes no sense. Mm. Well, I just want to let you know clearly, boldly, um, with as much love and compassion as I can, the peace is not because of something that we have conjured up mightily of our own strength. It is because we have the deposit of the presence of the power of the Spirit of God in us that gives us the peace of Christ. And so it's not the avoidance of hardship. It's that we can actually endure it because we know that God's got us, that he is holding us. That's so good. And we have an assurance that goes beyond our own ability to fix something, control something, navigate something. You know, I have, I have the assurance that, that God is going to give me the thoughts I need to think. He's going to um, give my heart a peace that passes all understanding the more that I look to him. And that's why it's so important to get into God's word and let God's word get into us because these are constant deposits of God's assurance, God's peace, God's truth. And truth is what we need to crowd out the lies that can sometimes get in us that make us doubt the goodness of God or make us doubt the hope beyond our circumstances. Yeah, and I imagine that sometimes people have this sense, I know that I have in the past, that maybe Christianity or maybe faith, maybe this hope is for those types of people. Like you have to be this type of person in order to experience the benefit of uh, the gospel. And here's what I love about verse 23. I don't know if y'all caught this. I did. It says, but each in his own order. What does that mean, Paul? What are you getting at? What is, but each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. This is what Paul is saying. The church in Corinth at the time, there's a bit of social classism that's taking place. And there are these issues of people thinking much of themselves or less of themselves. There's issues of people thinking, I've got everything I need. And other people are like, I got nothing that I need. Mm -hmm. um, and what Paul is saying that there are only two categories in the kingdom of God. Uh, and there's only two orders. The first order is Christ himself. And the second order, all those that belong to Jesus. So there is no classism. There is no elitism. There is no distinction. You and I come equally to the kingdom 
uh, solely based on the fact that we belong to Jesus. That is our access uh, to the Father. And I think that is so hopeful for us that we don't have to worry about those things. Uh, Paul goes in, he says so much more in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, but I want us to turn now to uh, verses 35 through 41. This is really interesting. And we started by talking a lot about how Paul is really thinking about the Old Testament often. And in fact, uh, verses 35 through uh, 41, really 40, it's actually an echo of Genesis uh, chapters 1 through 2. It's the creation story. So we can read this starting in verse 37. Paul says, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel. The actual Greek there is probably better translated as a naked seed, but it says a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. Notice this. And to each kind of seed, its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind of human, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. This is that reversed order of the creation story that's actually taking place here. He says, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another kind. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For the stars differ from star in glory. Verse 42, and Lisa got into this. So it is with the resurrection. So he says, so the comparison that I just gave you of all these different types of seeds, all these types of glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. The actual Greek essence of the words for perishable and imperishable. For perishable, it means corruptible or the ability to decay. Well, this is the picture of Genesis chapter 3. When sin enters into the world, the first Adam, who we've been talking about, um, there was a perishability. There was this ability to be corrupted. There was decay that already started in the body. The other day, at least I don't even think I told you, like early last week, I woke up from sleep. I was sleeping, y'all. I woke up and my back hurt so bad. I could not move. Like, y'all, let me just explain something to you. You're what, 35? 35. Mm-hmm. You don't even know what you don't know. I'm, <laughs> that uh, stresses me out a little bit because I couldn't move. And bro was like, you need to take medicine. Like my wife was, was all on me. And so we had to- Yeah, because I'm 10 plus years older than you. And so when you get to be my age, it's not even like, oh, I woke up one day. It's, oh, I wake up every day. Oh, man. I mean, it's taking two With weeks. With the aches and the pains and stepping out of bed. And it's just like, what is happening? So this is what Paul's saying. He's saying the perish, the corruptible, the, the decayable. From the moment we're born, it, it is this irony that there is decay that has actually begun to set in. And then the comparison, the contrast is the imperishable. Well, the Greek word here, the essence of this word means incorruptible. It's actually the very word the Greek um, authors would use to describe um, gods and goddesses who are immortal. So it's talking about a, a type of uh, inability to be destroyed. And this is the description that Paul is giving us. And the description is, is two things. It is physical and spiritual. It is not disembodied. It's not like we're just floating spirits around. It is no, it is our, our decaying physical body, just like a seed that's planted into the ground has a type. So if I had a bunch of seeds today right now, and one was an orange tree, one was an apple tree, one was um, uh, had grapes that grew off of it. The uh, tree that I planted, the seed that I planted that was an apple tree would not randomly become a um, orange tree. Because the type, the substance of that seed requires it to be nourished, to die, and then to bring forth life out of the ground and to become a tree that bears apples. That's the substance of it. And this is exactly what Paul is saying about us, that when we have transferred our citizenship, this is the big idea, when we transfer our citizenship from earth as residents of earth and um, in bondage to sin, when we accept Jesus, when Jesus rescues us because he is victorious at the cross, there's a transfer of citizenship that takes place and our substance changes. 
We go from the perishable to the imperishable. So what is sown is going to be like a naked uh, kernel, a naked seed. That's what verse 37 says. It will come about and it will keep the substance, but it's going to be a glorious uh, new reality. So here's the imagery. I lived in Chicago for many, many years. And in the wintertime, if you saw me walk outside, if any of you live in the Midwest, you know that the snow is horrible, but the wind off of the lakefront is miserable. And that wind hits you, it takes your, 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 um, your breath away. When I dress in the wintertime, I've got all of these clothes on and, and face masks. I mean, it, I, I am decked out. Lisa, if you saw me and you, we know each other fairly well, like really well, you know, you could probably recognize me almost anywhere we go. But in the wintertime in Chicago, if you saw me, because I don't dress like that here where we live, you probably would not be able to recognize me. It would actually take time for you to come closer. And maybe even I would have to say something. And then when I said something, the hearing would override the reality that you see with your eyes to say, wait a minute, that's Joel's voice. I know that high pitched laughter anyway. You know, um, and that's what's happening with Peter. Peter, when he hears the voice of Jesus on the seashore, it overrides that spiritual blindness, that physical blindness of, but Jesus died. Well, no, he's alive. And in the same way, what's taking place here in the scripture, it's identifying that when we are rise again, when we meet Jesus in the clouds, First Thessalonians 4, as that advanced party. And as we welcome the, the conquering king back to earth, to create the new heavens and the new earth, um, we will do so in a glorious new spiritual and physical body. And we are the first fruits of this new creation, which means you and I right now, where we walk, where we talk, where we act, where we think, where we pray, um, where we work, all of that, uh, we are actually the embodied new creation that is a visible glimpse to a world that is desperate for that hope. That's amazing. Joel, thank you so much for taking us a little deeper into 1 Corinthians 15. And um, I pray that this has been helpful for you. I want to let you know we have a resource, an end times resource to help give you some language as we have conversations around questions that people are asking in this day and time like never before. Um, I think they're asking questions about eternity. I think people are asking questions, even hard questions. Like I mentioned in earlier in this teaching, you know, they would phrase it, how could a good God let this happen or that happen? But here's what I want you to know. Um, we want you to have this resource. It's free. It's going to give you a lot of the verses that we've unpacked over these past three weeks. And uh, so we're going to pin it here in the comments. That way you can have access to that. And um, I pray that you will take today's teaching and send it, send a link to it to three, four, five, ten of your friends, because I think it's important for people to remember in the absolute hard realities that a lot of us are facing right now. There is at the same time a spiritual reality that can become a lens through which we view all that we're facing here on earth and we will have a different kind of assurance because we know god is good god is good to me god is good to you and god is good at being god have a great thursday bye-bye